My name is uh, Mark Hillemeyer. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Minnesota, and I'm also the director of the Center for Sustainable Polymers here, headquartered at the University of Minnesota. And I'm Chris Kramer. I'm also a faculty member here in the Department of Chemistry. I also have an administrative role as an associate dean covering graduate education, and so uh, some of the things I see in that role are uh, conflict between graduate students and advisors, and that's actually what we want to talk about today, um, how conflict can arise and how best to deal with it. Yeah, I, I think that this conflict um, between graduate students and advisors um, happens more often uh, than we think, um, but there's a couple, I think, key elements that we should, you know, that I like to point out is that it's kind of natural uh, in some sense that there can be conflict. Getting a graduate degree in chemistry or any of the uh, sciences it has oftentimes points, pressure points, uh, that are not easily resolved. And I think part of the two, a two part thing for me, anyway, Chris, is that how to avoid conflict, so some preventative measures, but also how to effectively deal with it. And I think that's an important kind of two pronged approach to thinking about being successful in graduate school. Yeah, and I think the, the dealing with it aspect can sometimes be challenging because there's a power differential. And so a lot of graduate right. students are reluctant to bring up the fact that conflict is affecting them in a negative way and, and don't know how to do it effectively, even though many graduate advisors might be receptive to discussing how to deal with it. I think, Mark, your point that uh, conflict is natural, you know, the nature of the scientific process is that you're exploring different ideas and you're offering different paths forward where it's not obvious which one is the best. Right. So, uh, you know, part of taking ownership of your project as a graduate student as well throughout your career involves going from being a little bit more directed to attempting to be the one driving it forward and uh, being perhaps aggressive in that way, in a good way, but good aggression. Right, I agree. I think that one of the one of the points that comes up and when is we don't often recognize the, the 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 starting point of the conflict. So oftentimes, in my experience, one of the places where it ends up is is that a student will come into my office and the student leaves um, with some understanding of what we just talked about and agreed upon. And I'm left in my office with some understanding and agreement about what we just talked about, but those are two different things. And I think that's what happens. And we both go into our own worlds and we don't meet for another week or a couple of days or maybe even a month. And we come back and the next thing you know is that up, oh, we're both wrong about what we thought we understood. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, I really agree. I've definitely run into that myself. And I, I think, you know, it highlights the importance of communication. So I think we'll maybe have a little bit more to say about communication and how most effectively to communicate. But at the end of the communication, also checking in and being sure that, yes, indeed, everyone agrees that what they think was communicated, there is a common understanding. That, that matters a lot. Yeah, I agree. One, thing that, one, one way to help that, this is a, this is a kind of a prevention mechanism, is that um, uh, simply following up after the meeting. I find this to be particularly helpful. Popping an email, uh, write me a note, and just clearly identify what the goals are for the next week. You know, it could be something as simple as I'm going to try this experiment, that experiment, and the other experiment, or I'm going to get you a draft of that manuscript, or by this date or this time, or or and, and from the advisor side, the advisor says I will give you feedback on your draft by this time. That's what I agreed upon. So then when it comes back up and eh, maybe we missed those deadlines, we can at least start have a starting point that says okay. I'm, I see I missed that deadline. <laughs> yeah, and it was something I was supposed to do, but now we know at least this is what we agreed upon. And if ambiguity does arise, there's nothing wrong with sending an email that says, you know, thinking more about it, I'm not sure if you said this or that. Can you clarify right. that for me? Just stay in contact. Yeah, absolutely. But then there's times where um, it, it that doesn't happen, and the prevention mechanism wasn't taken. I think you and I both probably experienced this. And now uh, it has come to a head. And so now there's a real uh, pressure point. Let's say, for example, I, you told me that I could, uh, I could be finished by this date and I told company X that I was gonna start on that date. But now we're not there. And I think that that's, somehow you have to now think about what are the next steps? How can we then come to a resolution? Because uh, now we've gotten ourselves into this problem. And I think, the, for me, one thing, Chris, is that um, is I feel like uh, both the advisor and the student uh, will do themselves a service by putting themselves in the other person's shoes. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for empathy. Right, exactly. Uh, and I think there's also a lot to be said for attempting to depersonalize a situation. 
That is to view it as the, it's like a scientific problem. It's a problem that needs to be solved. And it's not necessarily an I win, you lose solution. It's how do we get to an endpoint that best accommodates everybody's needs and let's address it in a calm, rational manner. So, you know, too often I think conflict begins with somebody making an emotional statement along the lines of, here's one for instance, you treat me like I'm a slave. <laughs> have you ever heard that one? Well, uh, I wouldn't. You don't have to answer yes. that question. <laughs> don't have to answer that question. <laughs> right, which, you know, is accusatory and immediately sets the boundaries for confrontation as opposed to something along the lines of, you know, when you send me emails at 11 p.m. at night and those emails seem to expect a response immediately, that leaves me feeling nervous and unhappy and I have trouble sleeping and I wonder if we could agree to a mechanism to avoid that happening. Yeah. That's, that's just a problem to be solved. Yeah, I agree. You know, that to me that brings up another thing. You know, you say I have a trouble sleeping, it gives me anxiety, is that um, there are other aspects of your life, not in graduate school, your personal life, that sometimes I think advisors think that you keep completely separate from your work life and they shouldn't interfere. And that's simply uh, naive. Um, and then there are students that think, you know, that's not really any either of the advisor's business, which certainly could be the case. But the problem is, is there's this overlap integral where your professional life is affecting your personal life and your personal life is affecting your professional life. And those are hard conversations to have with your advisor. And I think when you, if you can open the door a little bit, just like what you said, I'm having trouble sleeping, all of a sudden that opens kind of a, yeah, I'm having some other issues that are going on, and this is why. And then the, the empathy part, I think, is a lot easier to, to uh, appreciate from the advisor. I don't know if that makes sense. I, I think so. Um, I think there's kind of a unique challenge as well if you're in a, a big research group with a lot of people. There's a tendency not to realize that you know, the advisor is a human, he or she has only a certain amount of time in an individual week to spend with each person, and as a result, may not appreciate all that's going on. So often you may feel underappreciated or uh, that your work is not being recognized, and that again is kind of a lack of communication. You just have not perhaps gotten across in the time you have available just how much you've been doing and what's been the progress. So I, I think you know, a key thing we haven't talked about is when an advisor and a student meet, kind of clear expectations about what's expected mm -hmm. at that meeting. What should you bring? What's right. going to be the outcome? Why are we meeting? Right. There are simple things that can be done in, along those lines in, in the expectations of that current meeting, but also, like I said in the email course, the expectations for the next meeting and beyond. If you get into a cycle, I think, with your advisor, then you have a better, uh, that's productive. And, and it can help mitigate any potential conflict. I really do think that that's, uh, that's useful. And I, now I wanted to say something about that is that um, when you put yourself in your advisor's shoes, not, not, not only the amount of time to dedicate, but in most research groups, there is a distribution of personalities and dispositions and needs and, and, and the way people work. And your advisor, I'm sure is working hard to try to accommodate each of those special things, but it, I'm just telling you from my experience, it's challenging. And so a little bit of understanding that I've got two or three different kind of personality classes, or maybe even more, it depends on how big the research group is, um, to understand and help your advisor you know, deal with how one most effectively deals with you. I don't like it when you get upset, or I don't like it when you raise your voice, or I don't like when you call me, email me at 11 p.m. It's not the way I, I operate. Um, I think that's an important thing to help communicate to your advisor. Yeah, I suppose it's worth noting that you know more often than not, probably faculty advisors are less able to appreciate a student's perspective, but sometimes it's a student right. as well who's right. unable to appreciate that, you know, it turns out that grant, which is really important, has a progress report due on date X, and if the right. science is not done for that progress report, it has funding consequences that pay people's salaries. And so, you know, that, of course, can be addressed again by communication. It's, it's uh, good sometimes for advisors to say, why do we have this sort of schedule laid out, even though it seems particularly aggressive? Um, what's the underlying rationale for that? So let's, let's also talk a bit about, let's say that conflict has arisen. Mm. You know, and you're feeling as though uh, 
maybe you're even uncertain you want to stay in a research group and you want to know how to address it. Um, this issue of the, that we talked about just a second ago, what's supposed to happen at a meeting, you know, very helpful things are to put some stuff in writing, have an agenda. So when we meet, I want to talk about this. You'll be able to prepare better. Both sides can prepare better. Uh, have written outcomes as, as, uh, mm -hmm. as already alluded to. Maybe that's by email, but maybe it's more formal. There really will be some written outcomes. Right. Kind of goals and expectations if we're talking about something a little bit longer term. Uh, if there really are style mismatches, and that absolutely can happen. You know, it's not that any side is to blame per se. As Mark said, there are just different personalities, and sometimes personalities mesh well together, and sometimes they don't. Right. If they mesh less well, you know, stating up front how you want interactions to work between you in a calm and rational way can be effective. When, I agree. You know, you don't want to abandon the science, you don't want to abandon the group, but you want to smooth out interactions that otherwise can be challenging. I agree. If we go one step further, sometimes even when you try to do the best we can to take those uh, measures to avoid this, sometimes you get to a point where you can't go any further. The student just either can't, and, and that happens. And and what I would say to you is, is that at the University of Minnesota, and I'm, I'm sure many other places, the infrastructures exist to go beyond the conversation with your graduate advisor. And sometimes this happens. So you as a student, I think, if it gets to that point, need to understand the avenues that you have. And it might start at the director of graduate studies, it might start with uh, a collaborator, um, it, might, it might go to the department head, and as, uh, as, as Professor Kramer has said here, uh, to, the, to the dean's office. Um, and I, and I, I, I sometimes feel that students, um, you know, if they, can't, if they just can't work with their advisor or something, they just can't resolve a conflict with their advisor, is that they're stuck. And I think that it's important to recognize that there are mechanisms. We have something here at the University of Minnesota called a three-member committee before the research advisor is picked, but that three-member committee actually stays in force throughout their graduate career. So they have at least some kind of uh, group that they can talk to and talk to about an issue that they're having, that they're having trouble uh, resolving. Right, so a good graduate program cares about its graduate students. Yes. And its goal is not going to be to remove a troublesome graduate student. It's to try to resolve the situation so that the student has a successful completion of, of the degree and to recognize that those conflicts can arise. I will say that, speaking now as an associate dean, you never should settle for being abused, bullied, sexually harassed. So the cases that come to my office are not the easy cases. Um, and they tend to have crossed that kind of line. And in those instances, that is a much more serious issue, and one should take advantage also of infrastructure at the university designed to protect against those kinds of abuses. Happily, the number of cases tends to be pretty small, but if you're in that situation, you absolutely should seek out that kind of help and uh, take advantage of it, because it's not just bad for you, it's bad for that graduate program forever until it's addressed, if it's really a faculty member's fault. That's the subject of a different video, probably, but <laughs> just to make that point. Yeah, and I think that, yeah, and I think that that's absolutely right. I completely, I completely agree with you. Um, it's rare when things get to that level, but it happens, and we have to, we have to recognize that. So for all the new graduate students, I would say, uh, who are just joining the research group and they're just figuring out um, uh, figuring out how to interact with their advisor is that all the mechanisms you set, writing things, setting media agendas, I think all of that is really great to get set up as early as possible right. to get a very good working relationship with your advisor. Sometimes, in my experience, these mechanisms happen a year too late. And because either I'm not recognizing that there's a, there's a potential issue or the student's not recognizing the potential issue. But if you do that early and often, and again, you've emphasized it, I'll emphasize it again, communication, 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 talking, understanding each other's viewpoint and understanding what expectations are, um, it, it, uh, it, it really will make your life as a graduate student much more, I would say, uh, just simply easier. Uh, you have a lot of things you're working on. You're working on problems that nobody's ever worked on before. So you're trying to solve scientific problems that are tough. And if you have this kind of potential you know, looming conflict over here, that just makes everything harder. So Mark, you've raised a really key point. And of course, if you're watching this video, it may be because you're already in conflict. But let's talk about prophylaxis for the moment, which is, you know, how do you avoid these things? I'd say increasingly best practices, I maintain for my research group, 
a set of expectations that I hand out to everybody who's mm. thinking about joining it. Undergrads, grad students, their expectations for me too, as well as for the different people in my group. And so I try to convey right up front, what would it be like to work in my group? Um, and if you don't have that opportunity to get that from someone you're thinking about working with, well, ask questions about the sort of things that might be in there. You know, what, what are the working hours you expect? How will we communicate? Um, how will I be paid during the course of my graduate career? Historically, where, you know, what, what are your expectations? And then you're going in eyes open before necessarily signing on a dotted line. And even just asking those questions, you will earn some respect for trying to, uh, you know, establish a pathway by which you will continue to communicate and interact. I've learned something from my own video. I'll do that from now on. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice idea. We, we've got examples around <laughs> exactly. the university, actually. I'm sure we do. Good. I'm sure we do. Um, we talked for long enough. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.